Welcome to this bonus episode on Lecture Three, Financial Decision Making. If you attended either the morning or afternoon session, you will know that we didn't get to finish the entire Lecture Note Three. We are going to cover the solution to Problem Two, Separation Principle, and Value Additivity in this recording. In order to give you a quick recap on the background, we start from slide thirty-four. No arbitrage and security prices. On this slide, we are going through an example of a firm trying to raise additional funding. Say your company needs to raise a thousand dollars to finance a new investment. As we will go through in week six, when a company tries to borrow money from the market, they often do that through selling something called bond to investors. The idea is that they sell the so-called bond to investors. The investors will pay a certain amount of money to the company today. The amount of money investors pay is known as the price of the bond. In return, the company will pay back the bond investor a fixed amount at the end. So this is one way a company borrows money. They sell something in exchange for some dollars today, and they pay back investors an agreed amount in the future. Using numbers on this slide, we learn that this bond promises a repayment of one thousand dollars in one year's time. If the risk-free interest rate is five percent, what should the price of the bond be in a normal market? Remember that normal market means there are no arbitrage opportunities. It doesn't mean arbitrage strategy is prohibited. It just means with a specified price, there is no way to get an arbitrage profit on it. So here we have the calculation, which shows us that the price of the bond should be nine hundred fifty-two point three eight dollars. In today's term, which means the company can raise nine hundred and fifty-two point three dollars today by selling the bond, and in one year's time they will repay one thousand dollars to the bond investor. The next two slides explain why this nine hundred and fifty-two point three dollars is a no arbitrage price by looking at two possibilities of deviations. On this slide thirty-five. We show that you can walk away with an arbitrage profit of twelve point three eight dollars if the price of the bond is nine forty. How do you do that? Well, by following the strategy given in this box: buying the bond and borrowing at five percent from the market. We have gone through this in the lecture, so I won't repeat myself too much here. On slide thirty-six. We see an alternative deviation that the price of the bond is actually higher than 952.38, say 960. Again, there is an upcharge profit of 7.62 dollars if you follow the strategy over here. And this takes us to the next slide with this conclusion: unless the price of the security equals the present value of the security's cash flows, an upcharge opportunity will appear. And given we make the assumption of a normal market, which is over here, it means that there is no arbitrage opportunity. So that we can conclude, if you go back to slide thirty-seven again, we can make the conclusion that the price of the security, the no arbitrage price of the security, is the present value of all cash flows paid by the security in a normal market, which prevent any arbitrage. Okay, I hope that was enough recap to take us to finish the rest of lecture three. So problem two here we didn't go, we didn't have time to go through in the lecture. Let's do it now. This is a slightly more complicated scenario than than the previous example because there are two cash flows. So consider a security that pays its owner two thousand dollars today and three thousand dollars in one year without any risk. This is very important. No risk here, and suppose the risk-free interest rate is six percent. I know that sometimes I say interest rate, sometimes I say risk-free interest rate. So so far there's no risk, so risk-free interest rate. It really just means interest rate. Just means the R or the RF doesn't really matter. Just the discount rate, interest rate. What is the no upcharge price of the security today? Before the two thousand dollars is paid. So here, remember the cash flow is you pay the owner two thousand dollars today, as well as three thousand dollars in one year. So what is the no upcharge price? If the security is trading for forty nine hundred fifty, 
what upcharge opportunity is available. So to make your life clearer, we put everything on a timeline over here. And um, I just did his handwriting this afternoon after the lecture, after the, after the afternoon lecture. Um, which actually, you can read this one if you prefer, or you can prefer to read this. Whoops. Okay, let me zoom in. So here, if you put uh, the cash flow on the timeline, which here at time zero reaches now, you have two thousand dollars. In time one, which is one year's time, three thousand dollars. Given the interest rate is six percent, R equals to six percent. So how do you work out the present value? Because that's how you calculate the prices. And excuse me again for a for an email alert like happens again um, on the other day when I do a recording. Um, let's just say over here that present value tells you the no upcharge price. So time one, time zero, two thousand dollars is really just two thousand. You don't have to discount it anymore. That is already money term in time zero. At time one, three thousand dollars divided by one plus the interest rate, one plus zero point zero six. So which is 2830.19. So the present value of cash flows is 2000 plus 2830.19. That gives you $4,830.19. And this is the no upcharge price, which is defined in the previous slide, 4830.19. And the question then goes, what if the price is not 4830? What if it's 4950? Then that means you observed from the market the price is 4950, a, which is greater than the no upcharge price at 4830.19. So from the financial point of view, uh, which one is over value, under value? Well, this is bigger, so that turned out to be the over value one, and that turned out to be the under value one. So the idea behind it is that you always buy low and sell high. So you could say, I'm gonna buy this one and sell this one. It's easy to say that, but how do you actually do that? And that is illustrating the next slide over here. So you've constructed this little portfolio over here. So sell the security because the security seems to be overpriced. Sell security, you will get 4950 now. So here I have two times zero just to make things clearer for you. So you see that even though they both happened now, but I separate, I put in separate cells such that you see different action happens. If you sell the security, 4950, then you have to pay your investors $2,000 today, which is minus 2,000, and then $3,000 in one year's time, right? This is what a securities payoff is. What can you do at the same time as an arbitrage opportunity? Well, at the same time, you could deposit $2,000 now and take it out now. I will explain in a second. And then at the same time, you deposit 2830.19 now and take it out after one year. So why do we do that? The reason we do it because we're trying to mimic the cash flow over here. If you deposit $2,000 now, what do you, and then you take it out now, so which means you deposit, you lose that money, and then you get that money back straight away. So here, minus 2000 and 2000 which 2000 here and a minus 2000 in the blue part cancels out. And you deposit 2830.19 now and take it out after one year. When you take it out after one year, you're not going to take that amount because you can get 6% interest on that. And what is that? That is exactly $3,000. So which means if you're looking at your overall combined cash flows, at time zero over here is zero. At time one here is minus 3,000 and 3,000, which is one. And at time zero over here on this column from these two actions, you get paid 4950 and then you pay out 2000 which is deposit and then you pay out 2830.19 which is another deposit you walk away with a positive amount which is $119.81 and that is an arbitrage profit such that if you see people doing that you have a lot more people selling securities and doing that and you have a lot more people selling securities what will happen to the price? The price will drop eventually to the price that we just calculate, which is 4830.19, right? So that should answer the question for this one. It is a slightly more complicated example than the previous example. There are two cash flows, but please, if you're not sure, read again and review it over and over.
right? Because it's a video you can pause and replay. So what do we learn from this example? In a normal market, one, that market price is that no upcharge price. So here in a normal market, the net present value of buying or selling a security is zero. We just saw from the previous example that the MPV of buying or selling a security is zero. It may, if that seems to be an abstract again, and if you're not sure, let's move back to slide 34 again. Please don't get dizzy. We're just gonna slowly move back to slide 34. And let me just using the numbers over there to re rephrase the statement. So if you're buying a bond at a market price of 952.38, what's the cost? The cost is $952.38 today. What is the benefit? The benefit is $1,000 in one year's time, which is equivalent at $952.38 in today's term. So using a risk for interest rate of 5% here, right? So the benefit and cost are both 952.38, so which means the net present value equals to the present value of benefit minus present value of cost is zero. And on the other hand, if you're selling this bond for 952.38, your benefit is receiving 952.38 dollars today, you're receiving the price. Your cost is to pay out one thousand dollars in one year time, which is equivalent as its present value of 952.38, discounted by the 5% interest rate. So again, the benefit and cost is the same. So the net present value is zero. All right, now let's move back to slide 40. If you understand that perfectly, which with no difficult math of whatsoever, then it shouldn't be too difficult to see the conclusion on this side, this slide. That is, in a normal market, the MPV of buying or selling a security is zero. This has an important implication, which is security transactions such as raising a bond, selling a bond, buying a bond, in a normal market, it will neither create nor destroy value. In other words, for a company to raise money by selling a bond to investors, such action shouldn't create value or destroy value to their shareholders. The market has taken care of pricing their bonds to come up with a fair price that justifies the nature of the company's risk profile. This then helps us to arrive at a so-called separation principle, which is stated as this. We can evaluate the MPV, the net present value of an investment decision, separately from the decision the firm makes regarding how to finance the investment or any other security transactions the firm is considering. In a nutshell, this implies that if a company has a choice to invest in a new technology A or another te new technology, say B, which both cost around $10 million, then choosing either A or B should be independent from how the company comes up with this $10 million. So which means investing in A or B is the investment decision that aims to create value for their shareholders. Coming up with $10 million, which is the financing part that help fund the investment, shouldn't influence the decision to choosing either A or B. And this slide is crucial to understand capital budgeting in week 10 or chapter 9. Right. So if you can make a, a star over here to show this is a very important slide. And in fact, this is probably the ugliest looking slide I can ever come up with because look at the color combination. I have this orange here and this is like weird color, I can't even name it. And uh, yeah, so the reason why I do that is because this is such an important slide to help you understand what we mean by investment decision should be separated from financing decision. Now we have conquered the hardest part, we move on to yet another important concept to help us understand our role as a financial manager. Let's give you a macro view of the company. What else does the law of one price tell us? Well, the law of one price also has implications for packages of securities. So consider two securities, or really just investments, A and B, and suppose a third security, C, has the same cash flows as A and B combined. In this case, security C is equivalent to a portfolio or combination of the securities A and B. And so that is known as the value additivity, which is price C equals to price A plus B, 
which means it's the sum of price A and price B. This may seem to be disconnected from what we do as a financial manager, but remember that our goal is to maximize shareholders' wealth. To do that, we need to make investment decisions that maximize net present value. Why? Because you can think of a company as a portfolio or a combination of many going, ongoing and future projects. Just like Apple, you can think about Apple as a combination of iPad Plus, iPhone Plus, iMac Plus, all that. Right? To maximize shareholders' wealth, it requires you to choose an investment that has a maximum of MPV out of all possible investments that you can choose. As a conclusion, in week 3, what we have learned is that as a financial manager, our goal is to maximize shareholders' wealth by taking investments that have positive MPV so that can be value-adding to shareholders. This week, we are able to use valuation principle to compare costs and benefits, in particular, costs and benefits that occur at different points in time. We learned that in a normal market, where there is no arbitrage, we do not create or destroy value from trading the securities that help you move dollar from one day to the future, such as buying or selling a bond from the last example. This shows us that as a financial manager, we should separate our investment decision from financing decision. And lastly, as shown on this slide, we should make decisions that maximize MPV because the MPV of the decision represents its contribution to the overall value of the firm. So where do we go from here? When cash flows, so so far we assume everything is risk free. The company is not going to make any risky investment. Everything is just going to happen as is planned. But when cash flows are risky, we must discount them at a rate equal to the risk free rate plus an appropriate risk premium. And this appropriate risk premium will be higher the more the project's returns tend to vary with the overall risk in the economy, which is known as systematic risk. We're going to look at this in week 11, right? In chapter 11. And that's pretty much it. Remember, you need to do your. Um, MFL test. The first one is due this Friday and there are tutorial questions that will be held in week four the next week. Six questions. And that's pretty much it. Thank you and good night.